Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for their very kind invitation and apologies. I was supposed to be there in person. Fortunately, personal matters uh, uh, didn't allow me to be there. Uh, apologies again. I'll try to do my best from uh, uh, remote. Uh, so <clears throat> this talk uh, is uh, going to be a very brief introduction on uh, decades of work on layering and fingering convection. I will start by saying briefly what fingering convection is. And in the second part of the talk, I would try to give uh, a very biased uh, and idiosyncratic view, my view on what really is going on uh, and what is the mechanism of uh, <clears throat> layering in fingering convection. Okay, uh, let's start from almost the prehistory of uh, fingering convection. Uh, in the 50s, uh, Stommel, Arons, and Blanchard, uh, for those of you who are not uh, oceanographers, uh, uh, Henry Stommel was, uh, is essentially a god of oceanography, the guy who pretty much understood it all. Uh, they came out with an interesting little paper <coughs> They call it uh, a oceanograph oceanographical curiosity. Um, and what they describe is this. Imagine to take a copper pipe uh, or any other material which is uh, very conductive, which conduces uh, heat very, very well. And imagine to make this copper pipe uh, uh, very long so that, uh, and immerse it into, into the ocean. Uh, they even imagine to have something like uh, one kilometer of depth. The reason is uh, to, to make it this long is because in general, in particular in the tropical and subtropical oceans, you have uh, uh, top water, top layer, which is generally warm but salty, and a lower layer, which is uh, much colder and has less salinity. However, the density obviously is still stratified in such a way that uh, the top layer is, li is less dense than the lower layers. So it's a continuous stratification. And uh, what is the curiosity? The curiosity consists in this. If you pump up water along this pipe uh, so that uh, at a certain point, the entire pipe uh, is filled with water that uh, uh, comes from the bottom, then you have the pipe that contains uh, a lot less salt than an equivalent water column next to it. However, the heat diffusion through the copper will have, will relatively soon, in particular if the diameter of the pipe is not too big, will relatively soon heat up the water into the, uh, into the pipe. So as a first approximation, you may think to have a, pi a, a water column that has uh, the same temperature stratification as the outside water, but uh, are almost constant salinity equivalent to the low salinity of the lower layers. And therefore, the weight of this water column is less than the weight of an equivalent water column outside of the pipe. And so just by uh, hydrostatic pressure, water will be pushed out of the pipe. And it turns out that this can go on forever because uh, as the water is pushed up, heat tr heat goes through the pipe, uh, eats up the pipe, eats up the water into the pipe, but salinity is not exchanged, and so you have this uh, um, density difference between inside and outside of the pipe. So the basic mechanism is uh, you need some way to allow for lateral exchanges of heat without having uh, lateral exchanges of saline. Um, now, of course, the same trick would, would occur in reverse, but okay, let, let, let me move forward. <clears throat> it took only four years uh, to have Melvin Stern realize that the copper pipe really is not necessary. The reason why the copper pipe is not necessary is because uh, uh, salinity is a lot less diffusing than temperature. So heat, the, the, the coefficient of diffusion of heat is uh, larger than the coefficient of diffusion of salinity. 
And therefore, imagine a situation, a cartoon like this. So you have a, a lower layer, which is warm and salty, and has a density row two. And row two is less than the density row one of uh, the lower layer, which is fresh and cold. And in the middle, you have uh, a constant gradient of temperature and salinity and density. Now imagine to perform a perturbation whereby a wave displaces some fluid upward and some fluid downward. Now, laterally, <clears throat> you will start having diffusion of both temperature and salinity, but temperature diffuses a lot faster. And therefore, the columns that have been displaced upward will be warmer and the columns that have been displaced uh, downward will be colder. However, both columns will have mostly retained their salinity. And therefore, the columns that have been displaced upward will keep going upward, and the columns that have been displaced downward will keep going down. Now, this cartoon can be turned into a rigorous uh, linear instability analysis, and indeed, it turns out that you have an instability. There is a, a bandwidth of uh, wave numbers <clears throat> that is unstable. These wave numbers are uh, correspond to uh, small space scales. Uh, at least for for the ocean regime, for the oh, if you if you take parameters that correspond to the oceanic ones, uh, uh, the most unstable wave number is uh, as a lateral scale of uh, a few centimeters, and that's why uh, we use the num the name fingering convection because these columns essentially are finger like, are more or less the size of a finger. Uh, the phenomenon is extremely robust. I'm not an experimentalist uh, by any stretch. Uh, however, so this movie that I hope you are seeing is an experiment uh, done literally in my kitchen with just a, a, a small container. Um, in this movie, this movie is accelerated. So one second in the movie is uh, 30 seconds in reality. And here, my friend Yost uh, uh, and I are just pouring some uh, uh, hot colored, uh, hot salty colored water on top of a uh, uh, fresher water. And you can see these structures that fall, literally falls down. Uh, of course, there are mirror images that go, uh, mirror image structures that go up. But this should give you an idea of why, uh, of why this is uh, called the fingering convection. Now, so far is nice and is a curious, is a cute flow, but what is the link with layering? Okay, let me just uh, write here <clears throat> very quickly the um, equations. So the equation, the, 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 the governing equations are just uh, Navier-Stokes uh, with a, a buoyancy term that has a simple linearized equation of state and then transport equations for temperature and salinity. In this case, uh, I have used uh, uh, non-dimensional units, uh, a way to make the entire system non-dimensional that uh, is the same as that used in uh, um, Rayleigh-Benard convection. So I am assuming that uh, the domain at here has a finite height, and therefore I'm using the height of the domain H as my unit of length. And this gives me four non-dimensional parameters, uh, the Prandtl number, so the ratio between diffusivity and uh, thermal conductivity, uh, momentum diffusivity and thermal diffusivity, the Lewis number, the ratio between thermal diffusivity and salinity diffusivity, a density ratio, which may be thought simply as uh, um, these alpha and beta are the coefficients of thermal expansion and salinity contraction in the linearized uh, equation state. Uh, the density ratio is, you should really think about the, the ratio of the slopes of the temperature and salinity, uh, uh, temperature and salinity stratification. This is what really this is. Uh, the ratio of the slopes of the stratification of temperature and salinity. And then you have a Rayleigh number, uh, a conventional Rayleigh number. If you want to be really rigorous, you should admit that there is a fifth uh, uh, non-dimensional number, which is the aspect ratio. Most of the studies done on salinity, on fingering convection, uh, do not take into account the Rayleigh number because they consider 
uh, um, vertically unbounded domains, which is something that I object to, but this is what you will find generally in the literature. A necessary con condition for fingering instability, this comes from the linear stability analysis, <clears throat> is that uh, the uh, uh, density ratio, this non-dimensional quantity, has to be sandwiched between one and the Lewis number. If it's larger than the Lewis number, everything is stable. If it's smaller than one, then you have a top-heavy fluid and your convection will look a lot more like Rayleigh convection. Okay, so I was saying, what is the link with uh, <clears throat> with layering? Well, oceanographers, after Melvin Stern showed that you don't really need a copper pipe, oceanographers went out at sea and started uh, looking for uh, finger powerable conditions. And they found them pretty much anywhere in the tropical and part of the subtropical oceans, including the Mediterranean. Uh, this particular profile comes from uh, um, the, the, the tropical Atlantic. This is uh, offshore of Guyana, if I remember correctly. And uh, lo and behold, you have these staircases. So the fingers occur in these steps. And then uh, these steps, these high gradient regions uh, are separated by regions where the vertical gradient uh, is pretty much zero. And uh, uh, it is supposed to, they are supposed to be dominated by um, convection that looks very much like Rayleigh Bernard. Uh, just to give you an idea on how to read this graph, uh, here the independent variable is depth or pressure, same thing, uh, and you read it on the vertical axis. And then uh, salinity is here on the horizontal, top horizontal axis and temperature is here on the bottom horizontal axis. Uh, it turns out that then uh, uh, follow-up experiment, laboratory experiments manage, they are not that easy to perform, but follow-up laboratory experiments uh, made by Tarn and Stern uh, actually showed the formation of uh, uh, layering in uh, fingering convection. <clears throat> so what is the mechanism of layering? The first idea really was uh, by Stern and then refined by Hollier. And uh, it's uh, really a perturbation of what is called the elevator mode. I was just saying that most of the studies use uh, an unbounded domain. Now it turns out that in an unbounded domain, uh, this solution, which would be uh, say what you would get from auto linear stability analysis, this is not a perturbative solution. This is an exact solution. Uh, because the nonlinear terms simply cancel out if you impose uh, this particular setup. So you have just a, a checkerboard plant form in sines and cosines, uh, constant vertical velocities, zero horizontal velocities, uh, temperature and salinities have uh, a vertical gradient, uh, uh, and then uh, this fluctuation that grows exponentially. Now, this is an exact solution. However, it grows exponential in time. It never stops. So is this solution, this is called so, the so-called elevator mode, is this stable? Well, it turns out, no, it's not stable. It's not stable at all. And in particular, Stern and Collier looked uh, uh, at perturbations like the one depicted here. This comes from Collier's paper. <coughs> so you just impose a, a perturbation that correspond to very, very, very long wavelengths, uh, much longer than the characteristic width of these columns. And then you can do um, uh, a perturbative analysis uh, and you discover that uh, the elevator mode is unstable to this sort of perturbations when this number, which is called the Stern number, it's a combination of fluxes and gradients, uh, <clears throat> is larger than attrition. So, well, now we are happy because uh, then you say, hey, after all, these are convective modes, motions, these column, these elevator modes uh, leaves in a stratified fluid, a fluid where density increases downward. And therefore this fluid can sustain internal waves. So this, this growing long wavelength growing perturbation will excite internal waves. 
internal waves uh, eventually will break uh, and uh, will mix some regions of the fluid, make uh, the gradients sharper in some other regions. And um, here we go, we have layering. So this was initially thought to be the mechanism of layering. Unfortunately, uh, already earlier, uh, just a few years later, uh, started look at more general ways to perturb uh, the elevator mode because this is a very special case where you have to have these very long wavelengths and it turns out that uh, yes that long wavelength instability exists but uh, it grows very slowly there are other instabilities that grows that grow much much faster and all these other instabilities uh, uh, correspond to um, perturbation that have a, a space scale which is very small much smaller than that that you require in order to excite internal waves uh, this is uh, a computer simulation numerical simulation that comes from the paper by Stern and Simeonov where you see clearly see that these columns uh, uh, get get broken down by this zigzag instability or, or wavy instability call it as you wish but my point is that this instability has a wavelength uh, which is not much larger than the lateral size of these columns. And uh, when you finally reach uh, the uh, nonlinear regime, you have these finger-like structures, just like uh, uh, you have seen in my little kitchen experiment. So, no, sorry, uh, the instability of the elevator mode is not what produces layering. There's got to be something else. This is not. In fact, uh, around uh, circa about 2000, you know, at the turn of the millennium, many people were uh, actually convinced that uh, the reason of the ocean staircases was not uh, a layering stability of fingering convection. There's, there must have been something else. Uh, 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 there are many hypotheses, but I don't have the time to, to get into those details. Anyway. Uh, so if you wait a few more years, however, Timur Radko, a student of Stearns, came up with an idea. <clears throat> and this idea is, uh, as of today, uh, I should say the accepted uh, theory, the mainstream theory uh, for layering in uh, fingering convection. So the idea is uh, actually fairly simple. Let's write two conservation laws, one for temperature and one for salinity. So you just say that, uh, and here we consider quantities that are uh, average over the horizontal and over some depth that, uh, uh, an interval of depth that is uh, larger than the typical size of these uh, finger structures. Uh, so this T is a uh, uh, average temperature and this S is a, uh, average salinity uh, in such a way that now temperature and salinity depend only on time and depth. And of course, they will have their own flux, <coughs> Ft, flux of temperature, Fs of flux of salinity. And let's model these flux. The salinity flux is modeled just as a uh, thick flow, it just uh, depends on the <coughs> gradient temperature with a function the Nussel in non-dimensional units this would be a Nussel number that is supposed to depend on the density ratio you remember the density ratio is that ratio of the slopes of the temperature and salinity uh, uh, temperature and salinity stratification uh, this is our is the local density ratio the, the density ratio you really uh, measure in place at a certain height z and then the flux ratio, the ratio between the temperature and the salinity fluxes is not constant, but is uh, a function itself of the density ratio. So the density ratio is this quantity here. Now, the hypothesis is that uh, the, uh, the Nussel number is a decreasing function of the density ratio. This is perfectly reasonable. It matches all the observation, all the numerical simulations. And then if you carry out the calculation to the linear stability analysis, uh, it turns out that uh, instability occurs when the uh, flux ratio is a decreasing function of the density ratio. Uh, 
okay let's let's go here so the idea is that uh, you have a, a flux ratio function that is a function of the density ratio uh, this is the lewis number this is one so we have a fingering instability as i mentioned a moment ago in this interval uh, the flux ratio is decrease is a decreasing function of the really of the density ratio up to a minimum and then it starts increasing so the cartoonish way i'm not going to do the, the linear stability analysis but the cartoonish way to understand how this leads to um, layering is the following so you have a basic state that has a, a constant density ratio you do some perturbations <clears throat> and this perturbation produce uh, regions where the density ratio is a bit higher and regions where the density ratio is a bit lower where the density ratio is a bit lower temperature and salinity flux more or less at the same rate but when the density ratio is a bit higher the temperature flux is uh, less than the salinity and this means that uh, you have heat that accu either accumulate, accumulates in some regions and depletes in other regions faster than salinity and therefore uh, vertical inhomogeneities in density or buoyancy uh, are the result so the cartoon is fairly convincing and uh, this is all nice and good provided that, that uh, indeed you have a uh, flux ratio that behaves in this way uh, there are several versions of this uh, uh, of this theory the vanilla theory that i just try to to uh, over uh, suffers from an ultraviolet catastrophe um, then in a subsequent paper radko fixed this problem in 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 various i mean by by adding essentially uh, by harmonic terms um what is as i said this is the accepted way the accepted uh, explanation for fingering layering however as you may have hinted i am not convinced uh, and the reason why i'm not convinced essentially is the following in this cartoon this function is hand drawn this doesn't come from anything this is as being taken you know you have taken a pencil you have drawn a function like this a graph like this uh, if you do linear stability analysis where does the idea that gamma depends on the density ratio it comes from the linear stability analysis if you take the fastest growing the mm, fastest growing fingers <clears throat> uh, they carry uh, the, the infinitesimal perturbations have their own fluxes you can compute their, their ratio and you get uh, these uh, black lines the top panel a refers to ocean parameters uh, the bottom uh, panel b refers uh, to uh, a situation where you substitute uh, heat with salt and salt with uh, sugar this is usually <laughs> how experiments are done in the lab so top panel ocean parameters bottom panel uh, lab parameters and uh, if you don't choose the fastest growing finger but you choose the marginally stable fingers you get the dotted lines but still in the fully nonlinear regime what you get is all these dots the black dots are experiments the open dots are numerical simulations i honestly don't really see such a sharp decrease such a sharp dependence of gamma on the density ratio in fact even if there was a sharp dependence of gamma on the density ratio i would still be not convinced because uh, here every dot corresponds to an individual simulation or an individual experiment but in order to have the instability you need to have a dependence of gamma on the density ratio as the staircase form and so i have numerical simulations where the staircase form and i tried to it, it's not easy to compute these fluxes because you have to uh, cut your domain in slices uh, uh, average the fluxes over each slice uh, and then uh, make it run uh, in order to accumulate statistics but the best that i could do is in these panels that you see on on the right and uh, i simply don't see any uh, uh, 
anything like that. And as as of today, I mean, I, I maybe I may have done something wrong. I agree, but as of today, I'm not aware of any paper that documents the gamma effect. The gamma effect is this dependence of uh, the flux ratio on the density ratio um, as a staircase form. The best uh, that I've seen is a set of different simulations. Each simulation imposes a basic uh, density ratio and, and, and then you measure the fluxes <clears throat> on a time average. So let's go back to the basics. Uh, I hope this is enough to uh, convince at least some of you that uh, we may be needing yet another mechanism to explain the staircases, the, the fingering staircases. And uh, uh, let's look at what happens when, uh, we, we, sorry, when the uh, initial instability has long gone and we are in a fully nonlinear regime. Uh, if you are in a situation where staircases do not form, what you see, uh, and in general, you do not form staircases unless the density ratio is sufficiently low or the Rayleigh number is sufficiently high, then you have a, a kind of convection that looks like this. Here in this image, you see <clears throat> uh, isosurfaces of buoyancy, in fact, of buoyancy anomaly, so it's buoyancy minus horizontally average buoyancy. And uh, the surface is drawn at uh, uh, two point, plus minus 2.5 uh, sigma, uh, where sigma is the standard deviation. So buoyancy, this shows us that buoyancy is concentrated in these tiny blobs. Uh, some of them have a tail finger-like. Um, and these blobs go up and down. So they, mm, those that carry a positive buoyancy anomaly move upward, those that carry a negative buoyancy anomaly move downward. And these blobs keep going until they get destroyed, typically by interacting with other blobs. Uh, however, the interesting part is that uh, uh, new blobs form because uh, this fluid uh, is still subject to the fingering instability. So when you take a parcel of fluid of the right size and you displace it upward, it will uh, release laterally, it will mix laterally its uh, temperature, but it will not mix as much salinity and therefore it will gain a buoyancy anomaly. This has been, this is, should be clear in an intuitive way, but has been shown in a formal way by uh, Middleton and Taylor in a very interesting paper recently that actually gives uh, a criterion for the release uh, of the potential energy stored in the salinity field uh, um, that is actually what really drives this kind of convection. Uh, okay, so let me show you at this point a movie. This should probably give you a very intuitive uh, idea what I mean when I say that uh, uh, fingering convection is uh, driven by the motion of these structures. Let me stop this for a moment. Uh, here you have red blobs that, that carry uh, mm, positive buoyancy anomaly, they go up. Blue blobs, they carry a negative uh, buoyancy anomaly, they go down. The green particles are just fluid particles. They are passive Lagrangian tracers. They are there just to track the fluid. Ideally, what we would like to do is to track the blobs uh, with collaborators, I tried to do that. Uh, I still haven't achieved that. Uh, it's an exceedingly difficult problem. So the best thing I can do for the moment is to track Lagrangian particles and measure along this, along the motion of these Lagrangian particles, temperature, salinity, buoyancy, vertical velocity, and so on. As I said, this is the non-staircase forming regime. Uh, I'll get back to the staircases in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> now, let me define. Uh, let's let's examine those Lagrangian tracers, and let me exa and let me define a leg as uh, 
uh, a portion of, of the trajectory of one of these Lagrangian particles in which the Lagrangian particles maintains uh, the same sign of vertical velocity. That is, a leg is uh, uh, at the at the end of each leg at the end of each leg is marked by a reversal of the vertical velocity in the Lagrangian particle. So you can have all these Lagrangian particles look at the entire trajectory and chop the trajectory in these individual legs. <clears throat> and the idea is that when these particles are inside one of those blobs, they essentially follow the blob. This is not exactly true because the blobs are not Lagrangian are not passive, but it's approximately true. Uh, so then what we do is uh, histograms of uh, leg length, this Z quantity, and buoyancy anomaly. <clears throat> and we see that uh, for particles that travel very, a very small leg, you can have uh, just about any buoyancy anomaly, either very small buoyancy anomaly or very big buoyancy anomaly. It doesn't really matter. You can have just all possibilities. But if you focus on the, on the particles that travel very long leg, which for us are proxies of those blobs, of those <coughs> buoyancy cutting blobs, you realize that uh, that is only possible if the buoyancy anomaly associated with the particle has a very specific value. There can be fluctuations around an average, but uh, the average is very well defined, is this uh, red line. <coughs> Likewise, if you look at vertical velocity, for particles that travel very short legs, you have uh, just about any vertical velocity. But if you consider only the particles that travel long legs, the vertical velocity remains uh, in a band around some very well-defined average. And of course, the same occurs with the buoyancy flux or temperature fluxes and wind fluxes. Uh, this means that if you want to travel vertically, then you need to be in a Goldilocks zone. You need to be uh, a, a Goldilocks fluid par parcel that doesn't travel too fast, doesn't travel too, uh, too slowly, doesn't have too high of a buoyancy anomaly, doesn't have a too small buoyancy anomaly. It has to be just right in such a way these lateral exchanges of temperature that avoid uh, lateral exchanges of salinity are, can occur at the correct rate given the stratification. Uh, why am I saying so? Okay, uh, further information, let's look at the two bottom panels. These are two different simulations with different Rayleigh numbers, but the message is the same. The green line uh, that corresponds to the left vertical axis is the cumulative flux, flux fraction. And this is quite interesting. Uh, fingery convection by itself uh, carries density flux upgrading. I should have said this earlier. Because uh, uh, the salinity flux uh, uh, goes up and goes down, essentially salinity is taken down by the, by the fingerings, by the fingery convection, but temperature homogenizes laterally, the vertical flux of salinity is larger, measured in buoyancy units, is larger than the temperature flux of salinity, uh, the, sorry, than the temperature flux, which means that overall, this kind of convection takes, uh, makes uh, a lighter layer, low density layer, even less dense, and the lower high density layer, even denser. It's very, Cute is very peculiar because it's a uh, up gradient uh, in density. This is an up gradient process. But if you look at this, you will see that for small lengths, so here when the particles are not in the blobs but are in the background and just move this random motion, jiggery motion due to the passage of the blobs, then you have uh, a negative flux. So you have a down gradient flux for small lengths, for small, for par particles that travel small lengths have a negative flux. And then as you travel longer and longer lengths, uh, you get this uh, uh, positive flux. <clears throat> the red line uh, is just the uh, histogram of, in fact, it's the probability density function of the leg length 
in log scale, so it has an exponential tail, which hints at some sort of a survival process. Uh, long particles that travel long legs, so these blobs, essentially at every instant, at every interval of time, have a certain more or less constant probability of being destroyed. Okay, so I'm trying to convince you that uh, in the non-staircase forming regime, uh, this kind of convection is dominated by these small scale blobs. Their size is so small that uh, it is, uh, do that their motion is dominated by, by viscosity. At those sizes, viscosity is a very important, it's non-negligible. <coughs> However, what happens when we make this sort of convection more and more vigorous? And we can do that either by increasing the Rayleigh number or by decreasing the density ratio. Well, what happens is that the Reynolds number associated to each blob increases. So when the convection is not particularly vigorous, you have a Reynolds number which is less than one. And then the Reynolds number of these structures increases and exceeds one <coughs> as the convection becomes more and more vigorous. Which also means that these blobs, as the Reynolds number increases, they will start having a weight. They will start mixing the fluid around them. If the Reynolds number is, is less than one, that they will just move around in this very viscous fluid. But when it's uh, substantially larger than one, they can actually create a wake behind them. And so what's going to happen at that point? Now, this is a three-dimensional simulation uh, that uh, shows uh, that <coughs> these structures actually cluster together as time goes on. This is the corresponding movie. <coughs> you have the salinity fluctuation, buoyancy fluctuation, Kinetic energy, say velocity square fluctuation, and then the buoyancy, the horizontally average buoyancy. Now you see that as these things cluster together and produce this structure that have a scale much larger than the scale of the fingers, then you have some mixing. So you have a, a, a substantially higher kinetic energy in your fluid. And at the same time, the buoyancy profile starts to wiggle and uh, starts to give signs of layering. And this is what you see in, uh, uh, in the spectrum. At early times, the spectrum, <coughs> the, kinetic, uh, the, the, yeah, the kinetic energy spectrum has just a peak. By the way, this means that uh, fingering convection in the non staircases forming regime uh, is not a turbulent flow because there is no cascade. There is a very well-defined space scale. And then as the uh, layering forms, so you start having these convective layers, so you start having this tail that go up. Okay, so we have now something that mixes a stratified flow. And this is our hint, because it turns out that if you have a stratified flow, no double diffusion, just a single scalar that stratifies a flow, and you mix it with, for example, with a rod, if you mix it with the right speed, not too slow, not too fast, after some time, you start having layer. This is a very well-known process that has been studied at length. And the basic idea is the following. Uh, imagine that uh, the buoyancy flux produced by the, by, the lamp, by the bar depends only on the buoyancy gradient. This makes sense because if the buoyancy gradient is low, it's easy to uh, mix the fluid. If, if, if it's uh, uh, very high, it's less easy to, to mix the fluid. But let's also suppose that uh, the buoyancy gradient has a, a non-monotonic uh, uh, shape like this. Then you, you, know, you just uh, use a conservation law, uh, use the chain rule, and you end up having that this quantity in this region is negative. So you have a diffusion equation with a negative uh, coefficient. Now, of course, this mathematically is ill-posed. Uh, mathematically, this doesn't make sense. 
But in terms of physical intuition, this is really suggestive that uh, if you have this non-monotonic dependence of the flux on the buoyancy gradient, then very naturally you will create instabilities that will produce layer. And indeed, <clears throat> if you analyze those 3D simulations, that's what you look at, with, that's what you see. The buoyancy flux has a non-monotonic dependence on the buoyancy gradient. So it's there, this is something we do see in the numerical simulations. However, as I said, this sort of math uh, doesn't quite stand up to scrutiny. So we need something better. And uh, the something better really is uh, a replica of uh, uh, a model for uh, um, layering in, in stratified flows by Balfour, Yuli Smith and, uh, and, and Young. So we start uh, with a uh, uh, energy equation. So when I say energy, I really mean velocity square, <clears throat> which diffuses vertically with a uh, eddy diffusion, which is just the product of a mixing length uh, with the, in times the square root of kinetic energy. And then we will need a, a potential energy conversion term, a kinetic energy dissipation term. And then we have uh, two um, conservation laws for temperature and salinity. But what we want to verify is that uh, the gamma effect really doesn't play a role. We want to see if we can make layering without the gamma effect. Therefore, we assume a constant flux ratio. Now, I don't know if this is right, if this is wrong, but let's assume that the flux ratio is constant. If you do so, then the gamma effect is ruled out. And then we can combine, in that case, we can combine these two equations and have a single equation for buoyancy. Um, I will cut this short. We need to figure out what this uh, potential energy conversion term is and what this uh, kinetic energy dissipation term is. For the potential energy conversion, it's very easy. You very quickly convince yourself that this term is just the buoyancy flux. The dissipation is a recipe. And uh, we use this recipe. It's not a particularly good one because when the buoyancy gradient goes to zero, the dissipation goes to zero. Um, I'm not going to uh, go into those details. Uh, but my point is that if you use a different recipe for the dissipation, you still find analogous results. OK. <clears throat> so what is this? The important thing is this F. So the idea here is that the kinetic energy, therefore, so what is the, the, the buoyancy flux? Now, the buoyancy flux is an up gradient constant flux of buoyancy produced by those uh, blobs, those long those blobs that travel for long legs, minus a mixing term that is just an eddy diffusivity times the buoyancy gradient. So we parameterize the buoyancy flux in this way, an up gradient constant term and the variable down gradient mixing term. <clears throat> and then we finally need a mixing length and this mixing length is assumed to be um, short when the um, kinetic energy is small and, uh, and long when the uh, kinetic energy is high. So if you go through a linear stability analysis, well, first of all, if you look for steady solutions of this form, you realize that uh, each steady solution has a flux uh, that depends on the density ratio. And if you put this together, you have this non-monotonic uh, uh, shape of the flux. And then this is the linear state, the result of the linear stability analysis. When you perturb an initial state, which is in this non-upgoing part, this, uh, for example, 0 0.6, this corresponds to 1.6 here. You have a, a band of wavelengths that is unstable, but you do not have an ultraviolet catastrophe, which is good. 0 0.8, you have this, uh, 1, everything is stable. When you are here or you are here, you are stable. In this upgoing part, you are unstable. And this is just to give you an idea of what the... Uh, fully nonlinear uh, uh, solution look like. These are numerical simulation. Panel A is the buoyancy profile, which uh, developed clearly this steppiness. Uh, panel B is uh, the energy. <clears throat> and then uh, 
the lower panel shows as a function of time uh, the logarithm of uh, the uh, buoyancy gradient, which also shows that these staircases actually for very long times have uh, a very interesting dynamics. This was uh, studied in quite in some detail in the original paper by Bamford, Ewing, Smith, and Young. So you start uh, having uh, a set of steps spaced uh, as uh, um, depending on what is the uh, most unstable wavelength. So the most unstable wavelength uh, determines the initial spacing of the steps, but those steps then either merge or just disappear <clears throat> over very long times until only one step survives. And of course, as I said, all this model, which really is a recipe, and there are many things that are clearly not very realistic. Uh, one, okay, so we assumed that this, this was designed to be sure that layering could be obtained without any gamma effect. So we wanted a priori to rule out the gamma effect. And that's why gamma here is a constant. Uh, the other questionable thing is to assume that the flux carried by this small structure, by these upgoing and downgoing blobs is constant. It very, it's absolutely sure that it is not constant. This is an oversimplification. Um, but at least this model shows that uh, there is a way to make uh, uh, layers without <laughs> the gamma effect. Now, of course, you can go back and keep three equations, your energy equation, your temperature equation, salinity equation, and come up with some other modeling idea that links all them together. But the interesting part is that in a recent paper by uh, Pruzina, uh, sorry if my pronunciation is incorrect, Hoogs and Pegler, uh, last year in Journal of Fluid Mechanics, they, uh, actually showed that it's possible to have uh, to carry out a linear stability analysis of this model uh, without uh, having to do that many hypotheses on the particular nature of these fluxes of these c and d terms <laughs> and this linear stability analysis identifies general stability and instability conditions and it turns out that, uh, okay, when I read the paper, I was surprised that now that I'm thinking about that, uh, I'm not surprised anymore, it seems natural. There are versions of this general model that undergo instability through the gamma effect. Now, I'm not gonna spend any more time on this particular subject because this, I think, is the subject of the next talk. So consider this slide just a highlight, uh, uh, an advertisement for the next talk. But it turns out that this sort of DLY method of modeling uh, uh, <coughs> fingering convection, DLY from Balfour, Yuri Smith, and Young, is actually so general that encompasses both my way, way where uh, uh, fingers cluster and then steer the fluid, and Radko's way in which uh, uh, there is a gamma effect. Okay, and this is uh, and this is the conclusion. And I will give as conclusion just a very opinionated uh, uh, idiosyncratic blue view. Uh, my view is that double diffusion creates blobs. Uh, these blobs uh, trigger clusters because uh, when they have a wake, uh, the wake uh, triggers further double diffusing instability and the creation of other blobs that go in the same direction. This cluster grow up to a size where they can finally steer the fluid because uh, now they are <coughs> big enough to do so. And, uh, and therefore staircase formation is a process uh, driven by the steering of buoyancy, just like a staircase formation in a um, uh, stratified fluid with a single scalar that is steered by the rod. So double diffusion is involved only indirectly. Double diffusion <laughs> provides the rod, the steering rod, but uh, is not the prime mover of the layering stability. 
Now, of course, my model is just a proof of concept is not ready yet to be compared with the say numerical simulation in a quantitative way. But okay, let me just finish with a very forward looking uh, uh, statement. It may very well be that even this modeling approach may not be the end of it. Uh, there may be another modeling approach in which one tries to make a model of the motion of the blob themselves. As I said, this is a convection in, in which, at least initially, you have a small scale buoyancy carrying structure that go up and down and interact with each other. And some of these, uh, uh, when they interact, they get destroyed, new one get formed. Now, uh, I don't know if uh, you have ever seen that there is an old paper Oops, sorry. There is an old paper by CAC that uh, derives uh, the telegrapher's equation as uh, the limit, as a, a stochastic limit of uh, a set of travelers that keep going with a constant velocity in the same, is a 1D model in space, uh, that keep going in the same direction but at each interval of time have a, a certain probability of reversing their velocity. However, these travelers do not interact with each other. Yeah, each traveler is independent of the others. And therefore, you just have travel, the, the telegrapher's equation. You can have waves. You can transport waves. You don't have uh, layer formation. I just wonder if uh, there exists a version of this uh, uh, stochastic model that and in which these walkers interact with each other and uh, and therefore produce uh, layer. Uh, it's complete speculation. I really have no substantial work in the in that direction to show, but I just wanted to mention that in case somebody in the audience has any brilliant idea. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. the room. I have the microphone, Sarah. Okay, so I will, I will start with a question myself. So you you have shown three-dimensional DNS, and I was wondering, do you really need to go for 3D DNS? Or could you uh, really... No, absolutely no, I don't need to go 3D. Indeed, this, uh, this is uh, a two-dimensional DNS simulation. And in fact, uh, now that you mentioned that, uh, let me see if I can fish that out quickly enough. Uh, uh, okay, just as an eye candy, look at this. This is buoyancy, not buoyancy anomaly, just buoyancy in a 2D numerical simulation. This is laterally periodic. Uh, you see the entire domain, including the boundary layers. This is laterally periodic uh, with fixed temperature and salinity at top and bottom and free slip for momentum. Well, you see it layering, that you see layering that forms. Uh, I hope it's, uh, uh, I hope the resolution is enough to, to, to actually show it. <coughs> and, and, okay, let me pause the, the thing. You can see, I hope uh, this yellow layer that, uh, uh, so this layer, yellow layer and here there is an interface with some plumes shooting down uh, this orange part uh, is uh, uh, a well-mixed layer, and then there is another high gradient zone. And indeed, in this simulation, we do see uh, internal waves, but the internal waves uh, really are excited by this cluster, by these plumes that shoot up and down. Uh, they are not the driver of the mixing. The, the same simulation in kinetic energy Okay, this is the very same simulation in kinetic energy. Uh, the color scale has been uh, chosen for uh, drama. Uh, right now you don't have layering yet, but soon you will see in this region some big billows that will form. And those big billows, here we go, and those big billows actually produce the well mixed, the vertically well mixed layer. 
So can you actually explore the regime where the, where the blobs become non-Stokesian? Stokesian? Yes, we can, and that's eventually we will do that. I, I, I should say that I'm working on this topic very on and off, and uh, yes, that that should be that. And the question after this. Thanks. Is this on? Oh yeah. Um, Thanks for the talk. I'm interested in, so the blobs that you talk about, how coherent are they? You know, uh, do all blobs look the same? I suppose maybe a question would be summarized as, if you look at a spectrum, do you get a peak where blobs are in, you know, at some spatial oh, wavelength? Yeah, 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 or? yeah, yeah. Uh, as I said, uh, and, and this is another pet peeves of mine, uh, when uh, your domain is uh, only dominated by blobs, there are no staircases yet, the typical spectrum that you get is this red line. And this is the scale of the blobs. But it's sort of relatively wide as a peak, so the blobs are quite diverse. Um, well, this is a log scale, <laughs> so... Uh, the kind of blobs that you get, th this this image gives you the idea of what is the size of the blobs. When they interact, they can widen. See, for example, I don't know if you see my mouse here. Look at these interacting blobs. When when an upgoing blob uh, smashes over a downgoing blob, it typically flattens out. So you do have a range of si a range of sizes, but that can be a factor two, three, four, no more than that. Because when I look at this, I see a lot of like elongated structures, and I guess yeah. it looks like there's a strong aspect ratio to those things. So I guess, uh, do you have like a 2D version of that spectrum so you can see if they're usually elongated? Or I guess it, they spin around. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, they spin around. Uh, okay, let me say, my, my, the, the whole point is, is the following. Why, uh, the reason why you cannot have a cascade in this as long as you are in the... Uh, fingering in the non staircase forming uh, uh, regime is the following. If you have a buoyancy carrying structure that is really big, the lateral diffusion of heat is not uh, good enough, is not efficient enough in order to maintain, to keep maintaining that buoyancy anomaly. Because as this structure moves, uh, say upward, downward is, is symmetric. So imagine this structure that goes upward, it, goes into a fluid which is less and less dense. So if there was a positive buoyancy anomaly at a lower depth, as it goes up, that buoyancy anomaly is uh, uh, goes to zero if you don't have new buoyancy that gets produced inside the structure. All right, because it's a stratified, overall is a stratified fluid. So imagine you have a, so if you have, a, imagine you have a, 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 a buoyant, blob a solid particle for example it will go up until it matches its density with the ambient density those things can in principle travel up to infinity because uh, as they go up they uh, get temperature from the surrounding fluid and therefore their buoyancy anomaly with respect to the surrounding fluid remains more or less constant because they exchange temperature, they do not exchange salinity or exchange salinity very low. Now, as I said, if you make it very big, if you make this structure very big, temperature exchanges won't be fast enough to do the trick. Likewise, if you make the structure very small, then for very small structure, even salinity diffusivity will be efficient enough to uh, homogenize the, the salinity and again at that point you cannot create the buoyancy anomaly that propels the, the, the structure. So there is in a very uh, intrinsic way a cutoff to sizes. Now as uh, this cutoff is broad, I mean it's not sharp, it's not a very sharp peak, I agree, but still, you have a very characteristic size, and you do not have a cascade. In this regime, you do not have a cascade. OK, so we have time for a quick question from Pat. A quick question and a quick comment. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Francesco. The question is, uh, is there some critical blob population 
I don't know, size, density, or whatever it may be that's required in order to, you know, get you on the negative diffusion branch of the S-curve in buoyancy? Uh, more than a density, I would say is a critical speed, really. Sorry, speed, a critical okay. Red Reynolds number. And you can change that by changing the density ratio. Mm -hmm. So by changing the stratification of temperature and salinity, uh, as the stratification of uh, temp of density, in fact, it's really, you could really say, because the ratio of the stratification of density and salinity in the end is just uh, the uh, stratification of buoyancy. So if the stratification of buoyancy is close to vertical homogeneity, these things uh, zip vertically very quickly. And then you, in the end, you form star cases. But if uh, there is a strong uh, density stratification, then these things go very slowly and you don't, uh, you don't get that effect. Interesting. The, the comment I had, I was interested in your speculation on the cat's telegraph and the walkers. Yeah. I mean, one, something that's very similar to that is traffic flow. Okay, and uh, you know where, in a sense, instead of walkers, you have to make the you have a row of cars, oh, and they have to uh, maintain a distance from each other, and you have the problem of the reaction time of the driver, and you can get then a series of jams, which yeah. is kind of like a layering phenomena. Is that what you are thinking in the model? Okay, let's say that in terms of traffic, the only the only model that they know is the celebrated Light Hill Widam. Pre uh, well, model. this is in Light Hill, in one of one variant of their thing. Yeah. It, it's not the, the pure kinematic one. Exactly, and 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 this is what I know only one, only that one, which is first order, mm -hmm. and we will probably need something. I don't know. Uh, yeah, something that looks more like a telegraph. Equation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a telegraph you, equation version of that. Yes. That's exactly exactly what you get in in this thing. Anyway, and yes, I I was the, the answer to your question is yes. I was trying to to hint at something like that. Well, I mean, I would just comment that uh, a former student of mine and Oscar and me, we have a, a model of jamming in heat fluxes that has some application of layering in plasma physics from developing that idea. So Could it might be useful to you. Send me that, to that uh, paper. Yeah, I'll send it to you. Thank you very much. Let's thank again our speaker.